So I'm going to minister tonight with the help of the Lord on a subject that God has been personally dealing with me on. I uh, ministered on a similar theme recently at a conference I was speaking at with um, some other brethren. And I want to minister and talk tonight on this subject of the jealousy of God. The jealousy of God. Can we just pray and ask for the Lord's blessing? Heavenly Father, in the name of your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's full of grace and truth, we ask for your sovereign touch and your holiness and that the fear of the Lord would sweep into this room and our spiritual formation would accelerate. And God, that this company of ministry, this family of ministry, this Morning Star Fellowship of Ministries would come into a first love unto Jesus reality. Not just a concept, not just a commandment, but a first love unto Jesus reality. And Lord, we repent tonight of any evil thoughts, evil or idle words or evil or idle deeds that we've done, we ask the precious blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us. We pray you would have your way in this place, in Jesus' name, amen. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 12. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the land, with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. Pause. Now what he was saying to that generation applies to this generation as well. There is a, the spirit of the age the culture of the world that we must be careful we do not allow the world, the world system, the Babylonian spirit to infiltrate the camp of the Lord and it become a snare in our midst. He said, take heed lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you're going lest to be a snare in the midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods and one of them invites you and you eat of his sacrifice. And then one more passage of scripture which I didn't put into the PowerPoint but 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and this is a New Testament account of this. The Apostle Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 1, would to God that you would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might accept or bear with that person. 
The Apostle Paul was warning the New Testament church that there is a counterfeit Jesus who preaches another Jesus whom we haven't preached. There is a counterfeit Holy Spirit. He said, if you receive another spirit which you've not received, and there's another gospel, it's a counterfeit gospel which you have not accepted that he said, I'm concerned, I'm worried that you might embrace that or accept it and it's not the true Holy Spirit, it's not the true gospel, it's not the true Lord Jesus. I'm here to tell you there is a counterfeit Jesus being preached in some places. And I'm not judging, calling names or pointing fingers, but it looks similar to the Jesus that we know of the Bible, that sounds similar, it sometimes feels similar, sounds like a similar gospel, feels even like a similar spirit, but it's a counterfeit spirit. And I think that we need to take heed to that because God is jealous over his Holy Spirit. I believe that God is jealous over the authenticity, authenticity of his Holy Spirit. I believe that God is jealous over the worship and the glory and fascination of his son, that we would worship the living Christ, the living Jesus, the Jesus of Calvary, the Jesus of the resurrection, the Jesus of Pentecost, the Jesus that Paul preached. God is jealous over his spirit. God is jealous over his son. And God is jealous over his gospel that it be maintained pure. There is a generation of the righteous that is yet to come. And I believe that this generation of the righteous, it's more than one or two or three or four in every generation throughout the church age history, but I'm talking about a remnant, a company, a generation of the righteous that will be called out to do the greater works and God is jealous over them. He's marked their life. He will never allow them to live a sinful life successfully. They will be miserable if they try to become a prodigal. They'll be unhappy outside of their purpose and their calling and their ministry. I want to preach to you tonight about the God who is jealous, jealous over the true Jesus, jealous over the true Holy Spirit power, jealous over the true gospel. And when we preach the gospel without mixture, God will pour out his Holy Spirit without measure. I believe it's within God's mercy that he has withheld the greater anointing that we've been praying for, preaching, praying, prophesying. We, oh Lord, send it, send the last day outpouring, send the last day move of God. When you promised you would pour out your spirit upon all flesh, all flesh, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Lord, we've been praying for years that what Paul said, you know, that happened in Acts of the day of Pentecost, how that that was just the down payment. That was just the earnest of our inheritance as he referred to it uh, more than once in Ephesians. He said that the Holy Spirit that we've walked in up till this point is the down payment or the earnest of our inheritance, which tells us that the earnest means I'm giving you this much as a promise, as an assurance that the rest is yet to come. Just like if you put earnest money down on a house, you put 10%. The bank will loan you the 90% because you've put down 10%. You've given forth evidence. You've put skin in the game. You've, you've paid down 10% so they'll loan you the 90% because they believe because you've given 10% that you're so invested you can't just walk away but you're gonna pay back over the next 30 years the 90% that they're loaning you. And I believe what the Lord is saying to us is I'm so thankful for what we received at Pentecost. 
I believe we can be filled with the Spirit of God. And that Spirit of God that we have now can heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils. But I want you to know we've only received the earnest, the down payment. The fullness of our inheritance is yet to come and that's when Joel 2 and Acts 2 are not just fulfilled partially but the last outpouring, the last day outpouring, it will come on all flesh and the glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. It's coming. It's unstoppable. It's irresistible. The best is yet to come. The greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit is yet to come. We've only got the down payment. We've only got the pledge. You know, when God fills you with his Holy Spirit, he was basically saying, here's my down payment. You can do all you need, all that you need to live godly in Christ Jesus. You can accomplish it with the down payment. But if you can do this, if you can live godly and holy and heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils with the down payment, with the earnest, what's it going to look like when you come into the fullness? When we come into the full stature of the full measure of the stature of Christ, where we grow up into the head. When the Lord filled you with his Holy Spirit, he said, that's my guarantee, my down payment to tell you what you've got is a down payment. Your glorified, resurrected, immortal body is when your full inheritance will come. God will pour out his spirit without measure when we no longer cease to operate with mixture. Mixture of flesh and spirit. How many of you have prayed for that greater release of the anointing, the full inheritance in your lives and your ministry? I have. We all have. But I'm going to tell you tonight, the last thing that you want to do is to ask for an anointing that you don't yet have the spiritual, emotional, and mental capacity for. The last thing that you would ask or want to ask God is to give you anointing oil that you don't have vessels to fill. As long as the woman kept providing vessels, the oil kept multiplying. And the oil only stopped multiplying and ceased when she ran out of vessels. And I want you to know the Lord is wanting to enlarge our capacity. As ministers, as believers, he's wanting to enlarge our spiritual and emotional capacity because we're only this far come to a certain place where we can only receive so much but hear the word of the Lord. I believe over this fellowship of ministries at Morningstar, this conference in 2023, here is why this conference is different from all the great ones that's happened before. It's this conference where God has said, tell my people, I have come to enlarge their capacity so they can receive more release of their inheritance. If you don't have the full emotional, mental, or spiritual, or physical capacity to receive the fullness, then you don't want to receive it because if the wine skins can't stretch, they'll burst and you'll lose the new wine. The Lord has come to enlarge our capacity, our ability to receive, to increase our capacity. So the new wine that's being poured out that's coming isn't lost in wineskins that will not expand. And usually the biggest hindrance to the current move of God is the last one. And it has to look like it did before, sound like it did before, have the same manifestations like it had before. And I'm here to tell you that the wine will only come when the wineskins have been prepared and, and the wineskins have been touched and changed and have the ability to expand. So I release and I stand in the office to which I have been called to release over this company. 
a greater capacity, an increased capacity to receive the fullness of the new wine that you've been asking for. The Apostle Paul said, I magnify my office, my, my office. Well, for just a moment, I magnify my office and I declare boldly over this company that God has come and said over Morningstar Ministries at this face-to-face -face MFM Morningstar Fellowship and Ministries Conference, April 2023, I've come to prepare the wineskins for the wine. I've come to enlarge your capacity because what you prayed for, if God would have gave it to you, you would have lost it. It would have been spilled and the wine skin and the bottle would have been broken and the wine would have been lost. But God has come to do a work on the wine skin so that the, the wine will come. Because the wine will be lost if wine skins can't expand. We want to walk in the fullness of our inheritance as heirs of God, as joint heirs with Christ. How many of you read this, the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15? We're all familiar with that. You know, we've preached so many sermons from that story about how that the prodigals are coming home and they need to come home and how that, you know, he spent all that he had in his inheritance. He took it early and spent it in terrible lifestyle choices. And he was eating pigs, eating with the pigs rather, pig food. And you have to understand for an Orthodox Jew to be sharing a dinner plate with a swine just goes to show you how low and far he had fallen. And that verse says he came to himself. And he said, I, I, I want to go home because even the hired servants have it better than I have it. And we know the story how the father accepted and greeted him and received him back. But of all the messages that could be preached from the story of the prodigal son, I believe the most important truth for this hour that we need to receive and hear is that the prodigal son represents immature children of the father who have received their full inheritance early without the character and the maturity to maintain it and not lose it. Well, I feel the Holy Spirit helping me right now. <laughs> Receiving full inheritance without corresponding maturity and character can release a level of judgment that's awesome to bear. I'm talking about personally, internally. Because the greater the anointing, the greater the level of responsibility comes with it. And many people want the power without the character. They want the nine gifts without the nine fruit, but the nine fruit are to balance out the nine gifts. What good is it to have the gift of healing if you don't have the fruit of meekness and you brag about how great of a healer you are? The nine fruit are to balance out the nine gifts. The greater anointing comes with a greater level of responsibility and responsibility is entrusted and it's developed through training and equipping which is what we do here at Morningstar. And those of you who are in relationship and connection with us, what we try to provide here with the School of the Prophets, with a Kingdom Business Association, with a ministry, a fellowship of ministries, or whether it be MSU, or whether it be CSCL, or whether it be the Education Conference, or the Men's Conference, or the Ladies' Gatherings, whatever it is, it's all about training and equipping and teaching you so that your capacity is enlarged to the place you can receive all that God has for you. I would to God tonight that you could only see what God has in store for you, what the fullness of the inheritance looks like. I want to tell you, eye has not seen. It can't be seen with the natural eye. Ear has not heard. It can't be heard or perceived with the natural ear. And neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That means this fullness of inheritance thing that you've been praying for, the church has been seeking after and asking for this last day in time outpouring. 
It's something that the eye can't perceive, that the ear can't hear, and the heart can't even feel. But it only comes by spirit. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. And I believe that this place, this ministry, this fellowship of ministries, even within your ministries, is about training and equipping the harvesters because what good is it to have a harvest if you've only got a handful of workers and 500 acres of wheat to gather? What good is it to cast out the net? or to try to catch the fish if the net's full of holes or the, met, the nets meet, need mended. God is come in this conference to enlarge your capacity or your ability to receive. Maybe the same place, it may look a lot like MFM last year. There may be a lot of similarities, a lot of things may be the same. Some things may be different, but I'm telling you, there's something that's happened in the spirit that there is a gathering anointing that has come on Morningstar Ministries and our affiliates and our fellowship of ministries and those who are connected with us. And there's a gathering anointing to cast a net far. Oh, are you hearing me? And God is raising up harvesters and fishers of men that know how to catch the fish. And don't try to clean them before you catch them. God has put a gathering anointing on this place. But hear me, I'm not just up here wasting your time. I stand here in my office and I declare to you the word of the Lord and that God has gathered and assembled those here for this conference specifically to enlarge your capacity and to give us a new wineskin. You see the mistake that the Judaizers made. Remember the Judaizers in the early church. They're the Jewish Christians, and I love the Jews, and I believe there's an inheritance for them. They're about to come into their fullness. But listen to me. They're going to be grafted into the tree, the same tree the Gentiles are grafted. But please hear me. The mistake the Judaizers made was they said, we want the Holy Spirit. We want the gifts of the Spirit. We want the New Testament, the New Covenant ministry. We, we're, we're, we're good with water baptism. We're good with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but we also need to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. And Paul warned them, Galatians, he said, and in Hebrews, he warned them, he said, I'm concerned, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, for it's impossible you remember that verse all those years we read where he said it's impossible for those who have once tasted the word of God, tasted the powers of the age to come, that if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify the Son of God afresh. For years people used to read that and think, oh God, if I ever backslid or I had a strayful thought or I didn't go to church for a month, that I'm cut off and done forever. No, that's not what that meant. What he was warning was is if you come out of the old covenant and leave that and come into the new covenant and accept Jesus Christ as Messiah and embrace the new covenant and you go back into Judaism, you cannot come back in. That was the warning. That's because Jesus died at the cross to free us from the punishment of the law. That's why if you go back under the law, you crucify the son of God afresh. That's the whole reason he was crucified to begin with. And the Judaizers were trying to fit Christianity in the old covenant system. They were the early book of Acts church that was predominantly Jewish. Please do not think I'm anti-Jewish. I love the Jewish people. But they were the ones that said, we accept Jesus, but we still believe there, we need to follow the temple rituals and, and circumcision and all of this stuff. 
And you remember that council in Acts chapter 15 where the apostles met together and they said, it seems good to us and the Holy Ghost to not put on the Gentiles anything other than these necessary things, which was moral purity, godliness, to not eat meat strangled or, or bloody meat offered to idols. They were trying. This was the conflict Paul was addressing in the first century church in Galatians and Hebrews. He was saying you cannot try to fit the new move of God and take it back into your old system because you'll destroy it and lose it. And I'm going to tell you, many of you have come out of denominations and they were well-meaning and you learned a lot and, and you grew a lot in them, but you cannot take the kingdom of God message and what God is doing in this hour and try to fit it back in an old denominational mindset. You'll lose the wine and destroy the wineskin. You can't put new wine in old wineskins or else you'll lose the bottle and the wine meaning people get destroyed and moves of the Holy Spirit are lost. You ever wondered why moves of the Holy Spirit that happened in various places, and you can think of them that happened over the last 100 years. Azusa Street, think about that. Think about what happened with the ministry of John Alexander Dowie in Zion, Illinois. Built the city. I mean, he had originally a con the right concept. We should have a community for the believers, for Christians. But then he got to thinking he was Elijah and went off into error. Then we had the latter rain movement. We had a move of the Holy Spirit. And then we had the voice of healing from 1948 to 1958. A.A. A. Allen, William Branham, Oral Roberts. And then we had the charismatic renewal. We had the Jesus people movement. But have you ever wondered why it seems like those movements have a spark for one, two, five, maybe 10 years, and then it ends? Then we go through another law for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or hundreds of years sometimes without a real noticeable sovereign outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I believe the reason why every one of those movements ended prematurely where they never should have. It, could have. it should have kept building and building. The, the healing anointing of the 50s and 40s should have never been lost. It should have never been lost. But why were they seemingly lost? Or, or they just become a shell of themselves of what they once was because the wineskins were never prepared to be able to expand because the fermentation will affect the wineskin. And when you try to fit the wine in an old wineskin, you lose the skin and the wine. And that's why every one of these moves of God that have Touch the world, and I'm not minimizing or detracting or taking away from them, but that's why they always end up a shell of what they once were, or they fizzle out, or they organize, and they lose the life and power that it once had, just like what's happened with much of the Pentecostal movement. It started at Azusa Street in the 1900s, early 1900s. My family... My dad's mother and her mother and my grandmother's sister came into Pentecost in 1920. My dad remembers as a child them praying, cancers, goiters falling off of people and cancers falling off of people and hitting the floor and dissolving and disintegrating in front of their eyes. And many of you have never really seen that. You've only heard about it. And the reason being is these movements, they gain acceleration and then somehow, Men get proud and they get elevated and it becomes money driven and it becomes about big names and it becomes about making a name and it becomes about who has the bigger tent and who can have the, the largest numbers and, and who can do this and the wine is lost and the wine skin's destroyed also. God has come in 2023 to prepare the church for the last day outpouring that's not gonna last for two or three or five or 10 years or 20 or 50 or even 100 years, but it's gonna bring us into the second coming. The 
This time it's not going to be lost. This time it's not going to be misused. This time it's not going to be destroyed and fizzle out. Woo! Glory to God. You all know what I'm talking about. Movements that had great moves of God throughout history. I mean, right now we're upon the 100 years of Evan Roberts and the Welsh Revival. How long did that last? How many years? Three, four? Where is it now? Was there a real thing there? You better believe it. Was the power of God there? Bend us, oh God? Yes. But there was a level of resistance within the religious people of the day who said, we're only going to accept it this far. Don't force us to change this much. We're not willing to change. We're not willing to conform. We're going to be like concrete. Our mind is all going to be mixed up and set in its ways. And the wine is lost and the skin's destroyed with it. And so that's the reason why instead of having a perpetual move of the Holy Spirit for the last 2,000 years that should be doubling every generation, when Paul laid his hands on Timothy, Timothy should have got the double portion <laughs> of Paul's spirit. And then it should have been doubled again when Timothy passed it to his spiritual sons. It should have been doubled every generation. But it seems like every few decades or every few centuries, those who pursue the, the moving of the Holy Spirit have to have a, almost a, a brand new Genesis. Start over from scratch. Because every time when God pours out new wine, people try to fit it back in an old wineskin. And God is jealous over the new wine. So many of those great men of God, they were real. Women of God, so many of them were real. So many of them went through terrible things. They were ostracized. Amy Simple McPherson, on and on we could go. They were humans but they reached a certain level of popularity because the church always has to have leaders. The church always has to have people who train and equip in fivefold. But because they have faults and failures, and many of those men had struggles, and some of the, the women, they had struggles with their, their, their life or their families or their marriage, or they got mixed up in alcohol, or they ended up in some kind of heresy. I don't know, but a lot of things have happened to a lot of people who had the real touch of God and had the real thing. And I don't understand it why, why it is this way. But one of the things that God has got to break off of the Pentecostal charismatic movement is we have to break the cannibalism spirit of eating our own. And that's what Paul said. He said, I'm afraid that you'll bite one another and backbite and devour one another. Did he not say that in James? Instead of feeding from Jesus and from the life of Christ, we feed off of each other's struggles so we can push somebody else down and elevate ourselves and get noticed a little more. Or we don't get enough attention or get enough opportunities, so we'll just go across town and start a new church and see how many people will follow us. So that we can fill that need for attention or appreciation that we feel like that we didn't ever receive. And I want you to know, the enemy has always brought disunity when God was trying to bring unity. He's always wanted to pollute and mix the pure outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know what God is preparing us for in this conference. What the Holy Spirit said to me to say to you, you, is he has come to prepare the wineskins and enlarge your capacity 
So the final outpouring won't start and then be lost in five or 10 years and all we talk about stories and memories. And I'm not belittling anybody. We've got to have more vision for the future than we have memories of the past. As I said, the Voice of Healing movement went from about 48 to 58. The, 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 Paul Cain told me himself he was a part of that. He was just a teenage boy, 1920, and ministering with William Branham on stage and taking his meetings in Germany and, and, and all of that. And, and he said there was a period from about, Bobby, he said from about 1949 until about 1952, he said just about every person we prayed for was healed. Literally. I mean, we're not talking about headaches and, you know, and I'm, that's a miracle in and of itself. I'm just saying, I'm talking limbs grow right there. There was a three-year period where it was so pure. And it wasn't just one or two. There was about 150 of them in Gordon Lindsay's Voice of Healing. It started off documenting the healing ministry of William Branham, and then there rose up a company of about 150 evangelists from 1948 to 1958, and then somewhere along the line it started to fizzle out. And most historians agree around 1958 is when it really dissolved. Then the Jesus People Movement. I mean, Jesus Revolution, what a great movie that was. Seriously. I believe there's a Jesus Revolution 2.0 for this generation. Something really happened there in Southern California with the hippies. Something really happened. And sometimes we judge the vessel. We judge, think, oh, God couldn't use somebody like that. And he used somebody like that. He uses broken people who have problems. And we've got to stop looking at the people that God uses and thinking that they're God and invincible and above failure. And then when we see their humanity, totally lose faith in them and just completely fall away. That's a religious spirit. Now there's gotta be true repentance from sin. But it shouldn't have died. The voice of healing, Jack Coe was an incredible minister. I mean, talk about wild, crazy faith. People come up on stage, have a tumor in their stomach, and don't you do this unless it's really the Lord, but he would pay off and punch that tumor right in the stomach and they would be healed. Now that's unique. I, absolutely. But he had reckless faith. But it always seems to always end the same, doesn't it? Many of the leaders in those move, that movement, many of the others, either die young, get killed, or get caught up in gold, glory, or girls. We desire the book of Acts, signs and wonders and miracles, but we may not realize that what we are asking for, there's a corresponding measure of God's jealousy when we ask for that kind of greater works. I want to tell you something. Character is the only thing that will keep you where gifting takes you. Character and integrity, integrity will keep you where gifting takes you. <laughs> the greater the measure of the outpouring of his glory is commensurate with the greater measure of his fierce jealousy because he won't share his glory with another. Ask Ananias and Sapphira. Now, some people say, you know, I just don't get it. They lied about their amount of giving and they died. That don't happen now. <laughs> well, when you get the level of power they had in Acts chapter five, you'll have a corresponding measure of the jealousy of God with that power. 
And what you get away with in the outer court will get you killed in the holy place. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira with his wife sold a possession and he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Boy, can you imagine the headlines that they'd be writing about Simon Peter if this was today? I mean, my God would barely get t- people to give 10% or more. If a preacher in now time said, you sell your property and you give it to the work of God because there's such a move of the Holy Spirit, we need to have all things come. I mean, they'd write news articles. Seriously, imagine, think about it. And I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just saying, imagine if this would have hit the news, you kept back part of the sell of that property. And so you gonna be struck dead. Now, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. The problem wasn't so much that they didn't give the whole proceeds. It was that they lied about it. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what happened. Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they're gonna carry you out too. I'm telling you, there are meetings, there's gonna be services. You asking for the out, end time outpouring? We're gonna see meetings in the days ahead where people are gonna fall over dead. Oh, have mercy, Lord. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon some of the church, part of the church, the Pentecostal church, the charismatic church, the Baptist church, the Methodist church, all the church. upon all who heard these things. And look what the result was when the fear came on God's church. Watch what happens. Number one, the next verse says, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitudes, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out in the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on, fall on some of them. And also the multitude gathered from the surrounding cities, Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And they were all healed. Listen to me. When the, fear of the, when the fear of the Lord is restored and his jealousy over his people and his jealousy over his truth is realized, the fullness of the Holy Spirit is restored when the fear of the Lord is restored. And according to this scripture, When the fear of the Lord came on all the church and all those who heard him, here's what happened. Number one, signs and wonders. Number two, unity. They were all in one accord. Number three, the world respected and feared the church again. Number four, multitudes of believers were added and the harvest came in. Number five, divine healing and deliverance from unclean spirits and demons. Anointing comes. 
everything we've been praying for. Oh, oh, Lord, send the harvest. Give us a deliverance anointing. Give us an anointing to heal the sick. Lord, give unity in the church. You know, sometimes, by the way, I'll just pause and say, when we pray for unity in the church, you know how sometimes God answers that? He removes the people that stop unity. Oh, yeah. We want signs and wonders. Unity, the church in one accord. The rest dare, dare not join them, but they esteem them highly. Multitudes, the harvest came in. Divine healing and deliverance anointing comes in. Every sick person is healed and every person bound by demons get delivered. And you know what triggered all that? The fear of God. And when there's a fear of God, there's a corresponding release of the power of God to unify his church, to bring signs and wonders. Oh, are you hearing me? To bring in the harvest of souls, to see the net cast far and wide. Oh, div divine healing and deliverance anointing and everybody gets healed and all sicknesses are cured and all demons are cast out. But when the fear of God is restored, the power of God and revival is restored. But that also means a corresponding measure of God's jealousy is restored. Because if he's going to give you that kind of power, then he's got to trust you. You can't even lie about your finances. Whoa. Let alone anything else. Ananias and Sapphira made the mistake of lightly esteeming holy things. That's what was dear to God's heart. They became casual in their approach towards God. Oh my, think of the modern church. <clears throat> I'll go if I have time. No, listen, I was raised up. If the doors was open, you was there. Let me, just, just, let me just be frank and bold and honest with you. We want and we pray for a release of the power of God, but yet our approach towards God and the things of God and towards holy things, we're so casual about it. We just take it for granted and we lightly esteem it. And when there's a greater level of apostolic power released, there's a corresponding level of the jealousy of God and jealousy over his people and jealousy over holy things. You say, well, people aren't dying now when they lie about their giving. Well, it's like I said, when you have that kind of power of God released like they had in the church in Acts 5, there'll be a corresponding measure of the jealousy of God and that's why Ananias and Sapphira happened. God's holy jealousy is his total, absolute abhorrence of sin and unrighteousness. And we need the church to fall in love with what God loves and we need to hate what God hates. I didn't say hate who God, God doesn't hate anybody, but there's a lot of things that God hates. A proud look, a lying tongue, a heart that devises evil things, feet that are quick to mischief. That means they always run right where the trouble is and stir it up. They're right in the middle of all the drama. When there's problems or fires in the church, you can always guarantee they're gonna be somehow involved in it. Whoa. It's about time we start loving the things God loves and hating the things he hates. 
And listen, I don't preach to you tonight as a vessel that I claim perfection. No, 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 no. I'm human. I, I have faults and failures myself, but I am trying to go forward in perfecting holiness towards God. That is my number one priority is perfect. We have received everything we need to live godly and righteous in Christ Jesus. And I want you to know when we pursue holiness, not legalism, holiness of heart. I'm not talking about hairdos and hemlines. Because you can have long hair and a long hemline and your tongue can be twice as long as both of them. I thought that was pretty good. Listen, I grew up in that stuff, I know, and I love my Pentecostal heritage. But I tell you, when we get a true definition of what holiness is, it's what God loves. It's about character. It's about integrity. It's about intention. It's about motive. It's not about perfection. It's about motive. Yes. God's jealousy will not allow him to compete with anything in your life over first love and devotion to him. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your being and your neighbor as yourself. And if there's anything in your life that's hindering you from doing either one of those, God's going to shake and bake your life until only thing left is first love devotion unto him. Some of you went through hell. You've went through chaos. And some of it's been the devil and some of it's been God. And it takes true discernment to know whether God is disciplining his child or you are being targeted by the enemy. Isn't it funny? Think about it. The people that have offended us and have hurt us and that we don't like, when they go through hard times, it's God disciplining them. But when we go through it, oh, pray for me, brother, the devil's after me. You know what I'm talking about. Well, we, you know, we don't like them. We don't really care for them or we're in some sort of unspoken competition with them and they go through hard times. That's probably something they did. <laughs> we go through hard times. Oh, the devil's just really after me, brother. Oh, would you pray with me? God will is with the greater release of his new wine and oil and honey and with the greater release of his spirit is also a greater release of his jealousy. And I'm here to tell you right now, anything in your life, any hobby, any interest, anything that is competing with your first love and devotion to him, he's gonna let you go through hell until you make him number one. That's what happens when there's a greater release of the power of God. There's a greater release of the jealousy of God also. We want the power, but not the jealousy. Truth is, we want the power, but we want to keep our idols. Nothing can replace or compete with our love and devotion unto him. Hobbies are great. They have their place. Great. Self-interest, selfish ambition, money, success, letters after your name, degrees. They, those all can be good, but they can't compete or put God on the back burner because he will not be okay with being second place in your life or put on the back burner. He's not going to be content with playing second fiddle. God is jealous over you. God's jealous over how you spend your free time. Let me tell you something. If you don't forget, if you don't remember anything else I say tonight, remember this. You can tell a lot about a person by what they do with their free time. Well, that went over good. God is jealous over how you spend your time. He's jealous over your thought life. He's even jealous over how you spend your money.
He's jealous over what you're passionate about when that passion is stronger than passion for him. He's jealous over what you prioritize over him. He's jealous. You know the, the Ten Commandments? The first out of the ten reflect God's jealousy over his people. Number one, have no other gods before me. It sounds like he's jealous over our worship. Somebody say, he's jealous over my worship. He's jealous over how you worship. Whether it's half-hearted, whether it's lip service, or whether your heart's far from him. He's jealous over your worship. No graven images. You know what that is? That's, back then, that was little figurines or clay images that reflected the pagan gods. But let me tell you what graven images are for us. They're false images in our mind of what we think and believe God really is, but he isn't. The false Christ Paul talked about. Oh, my. What he warned, he said, I want to present you as a chaste virgin. Remember in 2 Corinthians, I read to you. That's what he's jealous over. He's jealous over whether you're going to accept a Christ that is preached that's not the true Christ. He's jealous over you're going to accept the gospel, but not the full gospel. He's jealous that you're going to be okay with some kind of spiritual experience, but it not be the real Holy Spirit. Don't use his name in vain. That was the third one. Let me tell you something. We should never allow ourselves to use his precious, beautiful, wonderful, glorious, holy name as a byword. Because, you know, it, it troubles me when I hear hear young people say things when they're frustrated and things. Jesus Christ. You took his name in vain. Oh, I thought of taking his name. His name was saying GD. God's not his name. It's his title. Now you shouldn't say that either. I think Taking his name in vain is a little bit like somebody irritates you, rubs you the wrong way, and you say, Lord. Now, isn't it something how that we use his name so casually? We speak of his name so casually. We'll say it as a byword. We'll just say it, speak it, say it in vain, say it loosely any part of his name, but yet when it comes to praying for somebody who with a sickness, suddenly we want that name to have power. When we come to casting out a demon, suddenly we want that name to have power. But yet so many, and I'm gonna tell you parents, some of you, listen, there's an incident in my home recently where one of my children used his name and said it like Jesus, C-H-R-I-S-T. I don't even wanna say it like that. And I correct, I said, I don't ever want to hear you use that name like that. Oh, but well, I don't understand when I pray for the sick in Jesus' name, they don't get healed. Well, it's because you said his name in vain how many times this week and didn't even realize that's what you were doing. Lord, have mercy. Was you really asking the Lord to have mercy or was you saying, Lord, have mercy in a critical, nasty way. Well, it's quiet in here now. God's jealous over how you use his name. He's jealous over your worship. He's jealous over false Christ, false Holy Spirits, and false gospels, false graven images that you have of him, or false understandings you have of his word. So he's jealous over worship. He's jealous over graven images, images of him that aren't the real him. 
He's jealous over how we use his name. Even the Jews get this part right. They won't even try to say his name. They said his name was so sacred and holy, you know what? Instead of trying to say it, Y-H-W-H, or they've even lost the pronunciation because they were so afraid of saying it that there's a debate over even the actual pronunciation of how it was originally spoken. And I don't even want to get into that mess because all you would not believe the religious devils that get involved in that sacred name junk. which vowels you use. You think I'm, this is real. I want you to know his name is powerful in any language it's spoken. If this gospel's for all kindreds, nations, tongues, and peoples, then the name of the Lord is powerful. Whether I say it in Hebrew, Yeshua, or I say his blessed name, Jesus, in English, or I say his name in uh, Spanish, Jesus, whatever language I say his name, if I say it with great reverence and great adoration and great respect, he knows the motive and the intent of your heart. How about this one? You get mad and you say, my God. Now, I don't even like to say this stuff because I'm actually preaching against it, but I have to say it so you'll realize it. See, the problem is we think saying the word damn is the only thing that makes his name being taken in vain. Well, it's true anyway. (laughs) Saying his name casually, loosely, lightly. No, when I say his name, it has a precious, when it comes off my lips, the Lord Jesus Christ. You say that's a religious spirit. It's not a religious spirit. You got to quit calling anything that's really sincere and genuine and holy a religious spirit. That's what carnal Christians do when they're under conviction and they don't want to change. They'll just say anything that's true or right or holy and you're trying to stand for it. You're just religious. help me Lord and I didn't say that in vain I really need his help (laughs) heavenly father our father which art in heaven sing it tonight hallowed be thy name the beautiful glorious marvelous, darling Son of God and His remarkable name, our precious Lord Jesus. I feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know what God's doing? He's messing with your wine skin right now. Seeing if you really want the wine. If we're, if we're trustworthy with the wine. The fourth commandment was to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. You know what that tells me? Not only is God jealous over your worship and he's jealous over false Jesuses and false gospels and false Holy Spirits and he's jealous over how you use his name but he's also jealous over your time. He's jealous over your time. Now we know and understand that the Jews fell short of knowing what the Sabbath meant. It was not just a day, although it was. It is a dimension. The rest of God. But he's jealous over your time, resting putting aside all of your busy activities and dedicating a day to him. 
And he said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. He's jealous over how you spend your time. <laughs> My goodness. When Peter, James, and John saw the Lord Jesus transfigured, remember? With Moses and Elijah, remember what Peter offered to do? He said, I'll build three tabernacles of equal size for each three of you. I'll build a tabernacle for Moses. I'll build one for Elijah because that represents the law and the prophets. And I'll build one also for the Lord Jesus. God let us know how he felt about that. God the Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Matthew 17, Mark 9, Luke 9. God was jealous over how his disciples saw the Lord Jesus. Whether Moses competed with the Lord Jesus or whether Elijah or the prophetic competed with our love and devotion unto the Lord Jesus or whether we put other things on the same level or pedestal and equal in our life or in our eyes. We categorize Elijah, Moses, and our blessed Lord Jesus. It's not like that for us. It's like work, hobbies, church. I want you to know God wants to invade all of your time. He wants to, he wants to fellowship with you when you're doing your hobbies. Oh, have mercy, Lord. As great as Moses and Elijah were, God will not share his glory. This is my beloved son, hear him. He cannot allow. God is jealous over his son and he won't even allow Moses and Elijah to have competition with his glorious darling son. Because they... God knew in the eyes of the Jewish people they respected Elijah and Moses and they represented the law and the prophets. And God said, no, hear him. God was jealous over his son. And with an increase of God's power must come an increase of holiness of heart, purity of life. Am I boring you? I hope I'm not boring you. How we use our tongue. God's jealous over what you talk about. He's jealous over you talking over trivial, petty, meaningless. He's jealous over you gossiping. You're, you're going to use your breath that he gave you to put down someone else made in his image. Oh, I didn't really think of it that way. No, God's jealous over how you talk. He's jealous. You see, great minds talk about ideas. Petty people talk about people. Don't be the kind of person in whatever church you're in that if you want, you want to keep up, catch up on the latest gossip, you know who to go to. You know who to call. You better pray you're not that person. You can get quiet all you want to. It's true anyway. We want God's power to come. There's a corresponding level of God's jealousy. If we really want his power, then we're going to have to realize he's jealous. Because out of the same fountain can't flow bitter and sweet water. You know what many people's problem are? They're suffering from divine boredom. They're spiritually bored. Help us, Lord. Be careful when you pray for an increased power of God's holiness. Understand that with this power comes his holiness. And what you got away with in the outer court, you won't get away with in the holy place. Yuza. Listen, Yuza. You're going to get in trouble if you don't understand that God's jealous over his ark. Because even Yuza 
He had good intentions, didn't he? He tried to steady the ark and even thought his intentions seemed good. I just want to keep it from falling. I don't want it to fall. The moral of the story is God is jealous over how you handle and approach holy things. With a greater measure of his power comes a greater requirement of responsibility and with greater responsibility comes greater judgment to whom much is given. Much is required. We want the much given part but not the much required part. The jealousy of God must birth a passion in our hearts for a new breed of men and women and boys and girls. They're the nameless and the faceless people who are not concerned with taking credit. They're not concerned with gaining titles or positions. No, they want a wholesale salvation of the harvest and recognize God's fierce jealousy over you. God's jealousy over his bride. His jealousy jealousy over his church, his jealousy over his creation, his jealousy even over his earth. When Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, remember what they said? The zeal of thine house is eating him up. When was the last time somebody looked at you and thought, man, the zeal of God, they've really gotten eaten up with that. Jesus, our precious Lord Jesus, was jealous over God's house. When was the last time you were accused of being too zealous for God? Let think about that for a little bit. When was the last time you were rightly accused of being too zealous and eaten up with zeal for the house of God? Moving right along. A respect for God's ways, his house, his laws. Listen, we must never come in and out of this place like we're walking in and out of McDonald's. I know this place or isn't the actual church. You know why this building is the church? Because you're in it. It's sanctified because you're here. But take heed to the things that we've heard less than any time we should let them slip. Let us fear we come short of the rest of God because the Bible said it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That's in your New Testament. For our God is a consuming fire and he's gonna burn up all the chaff out of your life. Everything that's not green and full of life, whatever chaff is just hanging on to your life, old habits, old ways of thinking, old ways of talking, even how you speak and how you talk, God's going to burn up through trial and tribulation and struggle. He'll allow the fire to purge your work. Let us lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. God is jealous over your attitude and approach in your worship. Let us lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. How many times have we just casually come to church and lifted up our hands because everybody else was doing it, but we, our hearts weren't really there. We were doubting. We were skeptical. We were critical. You know, if gossipers were as critical of themselves as they were as everybody else, the church would have been perfected by now. I thought it was a good point. Because before he comes for his people, he will come to his people. If we're going to be the greater works generation, we got to have a fresh impartation of God's jealousy. I'm not talking about a religious spirit. 
I want to ask, can God really fully endorse what we are currently calling church in America? Can God endorse his visit on this generation? You see, the legalism of Pentecostalism, many of you grew up in that. And you know what people did? They overcorrected and went into greasy grace and lawlessness. And, 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 and because they overcorrected the legalism, they fell into lasciviousness and lawlessness. Literally believe that some things are okay that the Bible says is not okay. Well, there's grace for that. Yes, there's grace for that, but grace won't come unless there's repentance. We gotta stop preaching a gospel that preaches grace without repentance because grace without repentance is a false gospel. And God is jealous that you, like the serpent, deceived Eve might believe a gospel that is good news but doesn't require a change of heart or attitude. There's a difference between holiness of heart and legalism and it takes true spiritual maturity to learn the difference because carnal Christians will call holiness legalism. But legalistic Christians will call liberty lawlessness. Woo! That's tweetable. <clears throat> Did you catch that? I, th I think that needs to be remembered. Christians that are carnal will call holiness of heart legalism. Carnal Christians will call holiness legalism. But legalistic Christians will call liberty lawlessness. This is why you gotta walk by the Spirit. If the Spirit wouldn't say it, don't say it. If the Holy Spirit wouldn't watch it, don't watch it. Because until we love what he loves and until we hate what he hates, to whom much is given, much is required. Oh my, I did put it in the PowerPoint. Look at me. I thought I didn't. Second Corinthians. Oh, I'm so proud of myself with a godly pride. I'm joking. Oh, that you'd bear with me a little folly indeed. Do bear with me. And that's what I'm asking you to do tonight. Paul wrote to the church, I'm jealous for you. With godly jealousy, there is a such thing. For I betrothed you to one husband, then I present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow like the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we've not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. There is a different Jesus, a different Holy Spirit, and a different gospel to the, the true. There's a counterfeit of the Jesus, the true living Christ. There's a counterfeit Holy Spirit, and there's a counterfeit gospel. And the apostle Paul was scared and jealous. And he actually said, I fear. When's the last time you've heard an apostle say he feared something? 
Oh, perfect love casts out fear. Yeah, but this is the different kind of fear he's talking about. It's a fear of God. I fear. Was Paul wrong for fearing? No. He was fearful about the right thing. That somehow you would accept the counterfeit Jesus, the counterfeit Holy Spirit, and the counterfeit gospel. James 4 and 1, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures adulterers and adulteresses. Do you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? When's the last time you've heard a sermon preached from that scripture? Woo! That's a good question, isn't it? Or let's read on. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Oh, but brother, that's legalism. No, that's the apostolic New Testament. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain? <laughs> oh, get ready. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. Does the Holy Ghost in you yearn jealousy over your time, over your approach towards God, towards holy things, how you talk, how you think, how you live, how you see other people, how you see God, how you spend your time, how you use his name? The Holy Spirit in you that you're wanting more of a release of is saying you won't get more of the inheritance until you allow the Spirit to yearn for jealousy first. This is the word of the Lord. The Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. I'm going to say it again. The Spirit who dwells in you desires jealousy. What's that mean? Your God, God, the Holy Spirit in you is jealous because your body and everything you do with it is his. It was bought with a price, the price of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. But he gives more grace, aren't you glad? Hallelujah. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. I gotta hurry. I need somebody to help me. One of you young men that are big. Strong. Yeah, you right there. Come on up here. <laughs> let me read, let me, let me demonstrate to you what this scripture is actually saying. When God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When you're proud and you're haughty in your look, or you look down on other people, or you think and really down deep, you know, I'm really more accomplished and I've, I've, I've done more and, 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 and I've, I'm, I'm really better than them. Even though I wouldn't say it, I really think it. Because <laughs> I compare myself. They might not even invite me to speak in my own ministry after this service. <laughs> God resists the proud. Now, brother, 
Be gentle. <laughs> I'm a believer, and I'm dealing with unspoken pride in my heart. And by the way, the letter I is right in the middle of pride. P R I D E. God resists the proud. So I'm trying to grow in my spiritual gifts. I'm trying to get where God has taken me. I'm trying to achieve my ministry. I'm trying to reach what that purpose that God has put in my life. And I'm trying to go forward and get promoted in the kingdom. And, but I'm dealing, not dealing with unspoken, silent pride that I don't even acknowledge is there. I'm going to try your God for just a minute. And I'm trying to get where I'm wanting to get. And I'm proud, but I'm not really acting like I am because I got a false humility on God bless you, brother. We're so glad you're here. But really I'm thinking about is my car nicer than his? Is my house bigger than his? Do I have more money than him? Do I have more properties than him? Do I have a higher position in life than him? So you're God and you're resisting me. And I'm trying to get to where I'm trying to go. God resists. Oh, the devil's fighting me. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Come on, God, keep pushing me. The devil's after me. All these trials I'm going through, Satan, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I keep rebuking the devil and he don't go away. But I won't deal with the pride in my heart because I won't acknowledge it's even there. And I'm in silent competition. But he gives grace to the humble. Yes. Here's what happens. You ready? My name is Chris Reed. I'm the least deserving to be holding this microphone. I have miserably failed God in my 38 years of life at times. And I can honestly say my life right now from everything I know is clean before him, but just I've failed at times and I don't deserve anything he's given me. And I've embarrassed him and justified it. I've made excuses for my sin in the past. Don't pretend like you haven't. but I'm the chiefest of sinners, I think one apostle said. Suddenly God is no longer resisting me, but I'm humble before God and before my brother and my sister. And the older I get, the more I realize how much I don't know And the minute I get impressed with myself with how much I think I know, God just reminds me that I don't really know as much as I think I do. I just talk too much about what little I do know. I need leadership. I need accountability. I need team. I need to submit to my brothers and sisters in the Lord. Even though I'm the leader of this ministry, I'm gonna to submit to this ministry team. They see error in my life, I'm gonna to listen to them. And I expect them to do the same of me. Now before I accuse them of something, I'm gonna make sure that I know that I know that I know.
So God gives grace to the humble. Would you come behind me, Lord? Lord, I need to submit to my brothers and sisters. I, I, I don't have everything right and perfect. I need help. I'm messed up in so many ways and I got blind spots and I don't always know and realize that I got blind spots. God gives grace to the humble. When I was proud, he was pushing me back and resisting me and opposing me while well, I blamed the devil for it. But when I get real about my humanity and my failures and my frailties, he gets behind me. And the more I humble myself, the more he promotes me, even when the enemies don't like it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Lord, have mercy. I preached the whole Bible tonight. Oh, let me just finish it. I'll read it quickly. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. How many people try to resist the devil before they submit to God? Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. When's the last time you have taken a further step where you can actually measure personally within your life, you've done something more than you were doing last week to get closer to God. But if you keep doing the same thing, the same routine and expecting more of God, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. You start the process. You start drawing, he'll start drawing. Ooh, I, I, that, I struck a chord there. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. He's writing this to the church. Purify you hearts, you double-minded. Lament. Mourn. Weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Boy, that don't, that don't go over well in the American church at all. Because really, the American church, a lot of it is comprised of 28 minutes of a shot in the arm of hope in the morning just to keep you to keep coming back next Sunday. Not really going to give you the meat of the word, just going to keep feeding you milk. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. It doesn't say humble others in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. If you've wondered why you think somebody doesn't deserve a promotion that God is promoting, maybe you don't know their personal life before him. God is jealous over his spirit. Submission to proven fellow brethren will bring a unity required for the anointing to flow. Remember Psalm 133? The head of Aaron, it flowed down onto the beard, down onto the garments. Unity among the brethren. <clears throat> I, I, I'll finish with this. There's a difference between intimacy with God, true intimacy with God, and over familiarity with the things of God. And what a lot of people call true intimacy with God is really they're just over familiar with church and everything about church. God is jealous over his word. Revelation 23, 18. If you add or you take away, you add to his word, he's going to add to your plagues. You take away from his word, he's going to take away from your name in the book of life. So much for once saved, always saved. God is jealous over his son. Hear you him. God is jealous over his word. Don't add to, don't take away. And I'll stop there. And God is jealous over your affection because the Lord told me tonight that many of you came and expected me to get up here and give prophetic ministry. But the Lord told me if I tried to give prophetic ministry tonight, just tonight, I would come under judgment. 
So I'm asking you, because I'm not here to entertain you. I don't have to prove nothing to you. And anything that we do to document the prophetic or document the supernatural is not to glorify me. I want to make sure you know it's just to document the fact that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The, the prophetic is real. Healing is real. I just want to make sure you know that. Here's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants you to know he's jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Your time, how you spend your time, your thought life, what you listen to, what you watch, what you do with your spare time, he's jealous over you. And I think every single one of us need to kneel down in the seat right where we are and repent over the lukewarm Laodicean spirit that is crippling America and the American church. Oh, I wouldn't be great to call you all up here and pray over you and some of you get to shaking and falling out and I believe in all of that. But humble yourself before the Lord. Come before him, heavenly father and our blessed Lord Jesus. We are sorry. for the ways we have failed you. God, we're sorry for our attitudes. We're sorry for our competition. We're sorry for our lust. We're sorry for not reading your word, for skipping our time of intimacy with you. We're sorry for carelessly being flippant about our prayer life. We're sorry about our take it or leave it attitude towards church and the things of God. We're sorry about our, if I have a little extra, I'll give it attitude towards giving in our tithes and offerings. We're sorry for our attitude, Lord. We want more of your power. You've got to give us more of your jealousy and therefore we've got to be more responsible because more of your power brings more of your jealousy. And there's the jealousy of God over his people. Yes, Lord, we do repent for the 60 plus million babies that were aborted in this nation. Lord, we repent over how we have in times past treated minorities and different people, ethnicities and race come and colors. Lord, we're sorry that we've used and abused people and didn't even realize it. We're sorry for how we treat people, how we talk to people, and how we talk about people. Change the wineskin, God, because you won't give the wine until the wineskin can handle it, because you're tired of pouring out the wine and it being lost over and over again in every move of God in history. We repent, Lord. Restore the fear of God to the church. Because the jealousy of God is coming with his power. With the increased power of God is an increase of the jealousy of God. Lord, we love to worship your name. We love to dance. We love to sing. We love to shout. And it's, I'm all for it. But Lord, there's a place to humble ourselves before God and turn our laughter into mourning. As James said. We repent of our pride. Lord, 
Lord, show us the blind spots, the areas of our lives that are not conformed to you. And we don't even realize it. Help us to see what we've not been able to see about ourselves before. Help us to see what always repelled people away from us and we just thought they were judging us but in reality there was something about the aroma of our fragrance, of our spirit and our attitude that repelled people. Help us to see what we refused or one, or, or one were unable to see before. And help us as a fellowship of ministries to have the wine skins prepared for when the wine suddenly comes. God, tonight, you have told me you have come to enlarge our capacity to receive, our ability to receive. Lord, we don't want to be like Simon Peter who was told to cast out your net and we only cast out one net and then we wonder why the net's broken and we've, lose, we've lost all the fish. We got to think bigger. You said let down the nets, plural. He only let down one net. Enlarge our capacity to receive, enlarge our spiritual capacity, enlarge our ability to receive and to change and to obey. We repent, Lord.